four college students brutally stabbed to death in their off-campus Idaho home. In the midst of a seemingly idyllic town, a malevolent force takes hold, leaving four families devastated and a community on edge. Join us as we follow the trail of clues and untold secrets surrounding the tragic Idaho murders. With each revelation, the truth inches closer, revealing a nightmare that refuses to be forgotten. Our story starts in a beautiful valley town in Idaho, Moscow. Formerly known as Paradise Valley, the landscape of Moscow is nothing short of breathtaking. Home to 25,000 residents, Moscow boasts a highly skilled and educated population. While it's known for its many thriving businesses and the University of Idaho, the city also has a budding arts community. Hampton International Jazz Festival, Renaissance Fair, and Pritchard Art Gallery contributed to giving this city the name Home of the Arts. One fateful night, a heinous crime would break the peace of this region forever. We will now take you through the events that unfolded, leading to a horrendous murder case. We'll be referring to the court documents that lead the police to the suspect, an investigative order. Investigators clearly had their work cut out for them. At around 9 p.m. local time, November 12, 2022, college student Zana Kunodal and her boyfriend Ethan Shapin were hanging out at the Sigma Chi sorority house at the University of Idaho. This house was five minutes from their main house off campus at King Road. Zana had two roommates, Madison Mogan and Kaylee Goncarves, who were visiting a famous local bar in the area, the Corner Club. Surveillance footage showed both girls leaving the bar around 1.30 a.m. with a male friend of theirs. Investigators would later confirm that this man was not a suspect in the crime. They leave the bar to another local food truck a few minutes down the road. Footage from the truck confirms that the friends ordered food and booked an Uber home afterward. Around 2 a.m., all four students were confirmed at their main off-campus house on King Road. According to an affidavit, Ethan, Zana, and two other roommates, Dylan and Bethany, were already in the house before the pair got home. What seemed like a fun hangout would ultimately end with innocent blood being spilled. Public documents say that around 3 a.m., the main suspect of the crime has his phone disconnected in nearby Pullman, Washington. Shortly afterward, a white Hyundai sedan can be seen moving toward the highway between Pullman and Moscow. Authorities confirm that this car matched the suspect's own. At 3.30 a.m., surveillance footage from King Road clearly spots a white sedan pulling into the street. The sedan would make multiple drives by the student's house, as if like a predator stalking its prey. The documents released conversations heard by the roommate, Dylan. There's someone here. Zana's phone record shows that she was up and using TikTok around 4 a.m. Dylan goes to check her door for the second time. She reports hearing crying and a male voice saying, It's okay. I'm here to help you. After that, the house's own surveillance camera records distorted voices, whimpers, and a loud thud. Dylan opened her door for the third time to check for the source of the noises she was hearing. Horror engulfs her as she sees a masked figure. It walks past her toward the sliding door in the kitchen. Panicked, adrenaline kicks in. She rushes back to her room and closes it shut. Hey there, a quick reminder that we post a lot of crime documentaries on this channel. We cover cases from those that have gone cold to those still ongoing. So, if you want to keep up with the crime scene, you can subscribe to our channel. It's always free, and you can change your mind at any time. All right, back to the crime scene. At around 4.20 a.m., the same white sedan can be seen leaving the neighborhood at high speed. At 5.25 a.m., cameras catch the white sedan on multiple instances near where the suspect lives in Washington. As dawn breaks, Moscow police uncover four bodies from the house. Four students had been brutally stabbed to death, and blood covered the walls and floor. It was a horrifying scene. On November 16th, Moscow police officially confirmed the student's death. Ethan Shapin, Madison Mogan, Zana Kunodal, and Kaylee Goncarves were all found dead in the house. Two students, Bethany and Dylan, were lucky enough to survive this attack as the killer didn't enter their rooms. Four families had been torn apart. The killer was methodical and relentless, and the knife used for the crime wasn't even found. 
We know from specialists and court documents that it's believed to be a K-bar knife, which is often used by US military personnel. The university students and the community were now drenched in fear. Was the killer someone they knew? Did they go to the same class as them? Speculation and confusion ran rabid. Interestingly, the suspect's phone had traveled to and from the house this whole time. Records confirmed that the same phone had been around the house on multiple occasions, months before the murders took place. Was it a mere coincidence, or was the predator carefully scouting the premises, looking for an opening to bounce? The police had a few leads on the case. Firstly, Dylan, the student who was an eyewitness of the killer. She'd give extensive detail on what the murderer looked like, his skin tone, his hairstyle, etc. The primary incriminating evidence in this case was a DNA sample left on the knife's sheath. The sheath was found under or somewhere near Madison Mulgan's body. Police traced this DNA back to the Kohlberger family and matched it to the DNA recovered from the trash the family had thrown out. The statistics recovered from the DNA confirmed a connection to the suspect's father, all while having a high rate of accuracy. The DNA sample in the cell phone location all pointed toward one suspect. Brian Koberger. CIA officers confirmed that the prosecution had a strong case. The Koberger family home in Old Brightsville is 10 minutes away from Pleasant Valley High School, where Brian Koberger got his early education. He'd go to spend most of his 20s at DeSales University. Josh Ferraro, a classmate of Brian, recalled that Brian was just your average Joe who didn't speak a lot. He said you wouldn't expect him to be the main suspect in a quadruple homicide. Brian was a clever individual with a PhD in criminology. Brian had also applied to work as an intern for the Washington Police Department following his PhD. He told in his application that he was interested in a doctoral level assistantship for public safety. Did he perhaps want information on how police run things? Maybe details into how the forensics are done at a murder scene? It's safe to say that all the evidence points toward a meticulous planner. Not only would this position give him access to the information after the murders, but he could also have gotten the chance to mess with the evidence. Sadly for him, his internship was denied. His teacher at the university, Dr. Catherine Ramsland, talked about her experiences in a podcast months before the murders. She remarked that she's come face to face with psychopaths in her line of work. Yeah, I've talked to them on the phone, through correspondence, sometimes in prison. She further stated that they exhibit coldness and a lack of remorse, which makes them a very efficient killer. Face to face with psychopaths, absolutely. The coldness, the lack of remorse, definitely. While many would feel the burden of guilt bowing their heads down to the floor after committing mass murder. Brian had put out surveys when he was doing his research at the university. Some of the questions he asked included, why did you choose that victim or target over others? How did you leave the scene? After committing the crime, what were you thinking and feeling? Did you prepare for the crime when leaving your home? These were some of the bizarre things he wanted to know. Was this perhaps his own research before the murder? If you ask me, this guy sure does give off some heavy psychopath vibes. Brian and his father had been pulled over by the police for speeding twice on December 15th. Take a look at your driver's license real quick if I could. But the police had no idea that they were looking straight at a killer. Brian was arrested on December 30th, 2022. After six weeks of accumulating undeniable evidence against Brian Koberger, he was now finally in the hands of the law. On January 3rd, he was extradited back to Idaho, charged with four counts of murder. On May 22, 2023, Brian was seen in court as calm and collected as a psychopath. A key note from this session was when Brian was asked to speak. He decided to remain quiet, and his attorney told the judge that the defendant chose to stay silent. On that, the judge entered his plea as not guilty. Although he is innocent until proven guilty, the heaps of evidence against him don't put him on easy grounds. How ironic was it that the person studying about criminals would one day become one? But the case was far from over. It was now a lengthy court battle that would take years to conclude. For now, the suspect remains in custody at the Latar County Jail in Moscow, Idaho, after he pleaded not guilty to the charges. Brian Koberger was indicted by the grand jury this May, meaning the long process of the preliminary hearings was bypassed. As this case is still ongoing, police are uncovering new details regarding the case to this date. Some of the recent probes into Brian's phone uncovered a shocking story. 
It's reported that Brian had numerous photos of one of the victims on his phone. Were they close? Did they get into an argument? Were they in a relationship? We can only speculate. The recent findings are sealed for the safety of the victim's family and for the integrity of the whole case. It can be speculated that he had only one target but changed his course of action when he came across the other three victims, as if making sure not to leave a trail behind. Nonetheless, he had innocent blood on his hands. Another chilling report came from the court recently, where a former colleague of Brian's confirmed that he'd broken into her house and rearranged her stuff just to mess with her. She then asked him to help her install security cameras, unknowingly that this was all just a sick prank from Brian. What kind of a sick freak is this man? The mother of Ethan Shapin remembers her son as being kind and caring. Looking back at the memories they had just a week before he was killed, Ethan's family decided to open a foundation called Ethan's Smile to provide scholarships to students at the school. They, however, decided to skip the trial, stating that it won't change anything for them and that they'd much rather put their energy into healing their kids. Kaylee's family, however, decided to push for the death penalty. They said that Maggie and Kaylee were inseparable. They'd grown up together as best friends, and Maggie was also like a daughter to them. Not only did this homicide case end the beautiful relationship between Ethan and Zana, but it also ended a lovely friendship. The community paid respect to the victims with flowers outside the crime scene and the high school. This tight-knit community would never be the same again. Whatever the outcome of this case may be, we offer our condolences to the affected families, hoping they find the justice and peace their hearts desire. That brings us to a close to the Idaho murders. Tell us in the comments if you'd like us to cover this case in the future, because it's far from over. Thanks for watching, and as always, stay safe.